Okay, now that we've calculated density altitude, we can make some expectations, some predictions about how different aircraft are going to behave at different density altitudes. This is just like saying if I place my aircraft into that international standard atmosphere land in Maryland at 100 feet, it's going to perform one way. And if I place it in Kansas City at 1,000 feet, it's going to perform another way. So what does that density altitude change affect in terms of our takeoff performance, our cruise performance, our landing performance? That's what we're going to get into here. So remember that an increase in density altitude, whether it comes from an increase in temperature, a decrease in pressure, an increase in the actual altitude that you're flying, or some combination of those factors, an increase in the density altitude is going to reduce the performance of the aircraft. The propeller won't produce as much thrust, the wing won't produce as much lift, and the engine won't produce as much power. So on takeoff, the way that's going to manifest itself, how that's going to affect us in takeoff, is that because the engine produces less power, it's going to take us longer to get to our takeoff speed. And because the wing is producing less lift, because the air is less dense, we need to fly faster in order to get the airplane off the ground, in order to produce enough lift to get the airplane off the ground. Those two factors together mean that we're going to eat up more ground roll before the airplane will depart. So here you see in the Kansas City model, at the density altitude 1,000 feet model, you have a longer ground run in order to get the aircraft off the ground. It takes more runway just to have the aircraft leave the ground than it does in a Maryland density altitude of 100 feet. Now after the aircraft leaves the ground, in that higher density altitude environment, your performance is still poorer, right? So your wing is going to be producing less lift, so your climb performance is affected. You're going to have a slower climb rate. It's going to take you longer to get up to altitude, and you're going to eat up more distance to clear, say, a 50-foot obstacle or to get above something that might be in front of the runway. So you see there that in addition to that extra ground roll, you're also going to eat up more distance to climb to an altitude that's considered safe, that's going to keep you away from any obstructions in the area. So it's a longer takeoff distance to clear that hypothetical obstacle at that high density altitude. The density altitude isn't the only thing that affects the performance of the aircraft on takeoff. The weight of the aircraft is important too. You'll see in the pilot's operating handbook that there is a maximum takeoff weight listed for the aircraft that you're flying. The reason that there's a weight limitation is that the higher the weight goes, the worse the takeoff performance gets. Basically, a heavier object, a heavier airplane, is going to require more force to get it up to its takeoff speed. That's going to translate into more runway needed in order to get to your takeoff speed. So you're going to eat up more distance on the runway getting to that takeoff speed than you would if you were that lighter aircraft in the bottom image. And by that same token, once you're in the air, remember, a heavier aircraft requires more lift, requires more of that lifting force, so you're not going to be able to get the same climb rate with a heavier aircraft. So you're going to eat up more distance on the runway, your climb angle and your climb rate is going to be worse, and you're not going to be able to get to the altitude that you'd like to in as much time or in as little amount of horizontal distance traveled. We haven't talked about wind yet. Wind, the speed and the direction of the wind, plays a really big role in takeoff performance. We always want to take off into the wind, meaning that we want the wind blowing into our faces or towards the front of the aircraft, what's called a headwind, because that's going to give us better takeoff performance. The reason for that is because the speed that we want to be at, the takeoff speed that we want to be at, is not based on our travel over the ground, but it's based on how fast we're flying through the air airspeed. And airspeed could be either because we're traveling fast or because the air is traveling fast over our wings. When you're talking about aerodynamics, it's the same thing. It's the speed that the wing is experiencing of the air that it's moving through. So if you're starting with a 20 knot wind coming right in your face, it's, it's like an extra 20 knots of speed that the aircraft is going to use to develop lift and to leave the ground. So we always want to take off into the wind as much as we can. Once we're off the ground, if you have that headwind, you will be able to climb at a better angle because it's almost like the wind is pushing you backwards to a certain extent. Your, your trajectory, your, your 
motion is still carrying you forwards, but that wind is having a little bit of a stopping effect on you. Well, what that means is that you're able to climb to a higher altitude without eating up a ton of extra distance. So your climb angle isn't as flat as it would be if you had a tailwind. So you see in the diagram there, up top, you have a tailwind. And you see that windsock there. It's uh, This one's colored orange and white. Some of them are colored orange. That's why I like to kind of uh, compare it to a carrot, right? You always eat a carrot from the narrow end first, right? You think of Bugs Bunny, you know, he, he had the stalk on the opposite end. He would start eating it from the narrow end. Same thing in a takeoff. We want to start eating the windsock, that orange and white or that orange windsock from the narrow end first. So it's not the tailwind in the top of the photo or in the top of the slide that we want to operate on if we can help it. We want to be operating with that headwind where that windsock is pointing its narrow end at us first. The surface of the runway matters. Believe it or not, you can take off from a grass, a dirt, even an ice runway uh, in some parts of the country or some parts of the world. Now, our preference, our major preference is to take off on runways that are paved, just like our highways, right? The reason for that is because a paved surface is going to provide less friction to the wheels that impact on the ground. Less friction means that there's less of a force stopping the aircraft. So an aircraft taking off from, say, a grass field like the one at the top here is going to have friction added to the wheels when it is rolling down the runway. So it's going to take more distance to get up to speed, right? If there's that friction slowing us down or preventing us from speeding up, we're going to eat up more of that grass runway to get up to our takeoff speed. Now, once we're in the air, the climb angle is going to be unaffected whether we took off from a grass field or a paved field once we're in the air it's sort of a moot point right we're just flying in the same air but you notice there that because we ate up so much more ground and takeoff on top there on the grass field our total distance traveled in order to get up to a 50 foot or an ideal kind of safe altitude is still going to be longer even though our climb rate was or our climb angle was unaffected we're still eating up more horizontal distance before we get to that 50 feet than we would taking off from a nice paved surface runway. If your airplane has flaps, you might be able to use flaps to decrease the amount of distance you need to travel in order to get to that 50 feet of altitude. What's happening is that flaps increase the lift that the wing produces, so they decrease the stall speed the aircraft will stall at. If you decrease the stall speed, you can take off at a slower airspeed as well. So if you don't need to accelerate to as high of a speed, you don't need to use up as much runway to get to that speed. So that aircraft at the bottom there with a 10 degree of flap used on takeoff is going to reach its takeoff speed sooner. It's going to get to its takeoff speed shorter in a shorter distance down the runway than up top where there's no flaps being used. Now, there's a trade-off here. Yeah, you're increasing lift when you use the flaps, but you're also increasing drag. There's no such thing as a free lunch in aviation, so you have to pay for what you get. So with a little bit of lift comes a little bit of a drag penalty. What that drag does is it decreases the amount of excess thrust that you have. You remember from class one, we talked about thrust available and thrust required. Well, thrust required is basically the drag of the aircraft. If there's more of that, you just don't have that much extra thrust, that much excess thrust, and that's going to translate into a poor climb angle. So even though you've left the ground sooner, your climb angle, the angle that you're going to climb out at, is going to be diminished with that flap setting in. Now, in a lot of cases, that's an okay trade-off because you notice in the picture here that at the bottom where we've used 10 degrees of flaps, we're getting a big bonus in leaving the ground sooner and we're paying a relatively small penalty in a reduced climb angle. So as you net those effects out, you see that the total distance needing to, needed to get to 50 feet is still reduced when you use 10 degrees of flaps than it would be if you use zero flaps. Now this is a big generalization that I'm making. Remember, I'm just a pilot, I'm not an engineer, so we're gonna have to defer to the engineers on this one and let them figure out what the appropriate flap setting is if we want a full performance takeoff, something called like a short field takeoff that we wanna eat up as little distance as possible to get to that 50 feet of altitude. And luckily they've done this for us, they've done this work, they've sat down and when they put out the POH, they've actually listed out the recommended flap setting for a takeoff like this. So in a Cessna 172, 
uh, in a lot of the Cessna 172 models, it's going to be a 10 degree flap setting. Other aircraft, it's going to be something else. Uh, it all sort of relates to kind of a moderate little trade off between a lot of lift and a little bit of drag. Okay, did I lose you with the excess thrust discussion there for a second? Let's go back to what we were talking in class one about the difference between the thrust available and the thrust required. That blue line, that thrust required line, is just the same thing as the total drag, right? You've got those two gray lines, the induced drag and the parasite drag. If we add those together, we get the total drag line, which can also be thought of as the thrust required line, right? If that's the amount of drag we have, we need at least that much thrust to keep the aircraft moving forward. Now, the thrust that we have available is hopefully going to be more than the thrust that we have required, right? We've got enough to keep the aircraft moving forward, and then we've got some excess thrust. Well, that excess thrust is going to relate to how large the difference is between the thrust available line and the thrust required line. So as you move up and down, or left and right, I should say, on that airspeed line there, that horizontal line, you can get to the point or you can get to the airspeed that gives you the longest dashed line there. That dashed line is going to be your excess thrust, the biggest distance between the thrust available and the thrust required. So it so happens that the point where you have that maximum excess thrust is an airspeed that's called your best angle of climb airspeed, also known as VX. This is another V speed and it's not listed on the airspeed indicator, but it is listed in the pilot's operating handbook for your aircraft. Climbing at VX allows the aircraft to reach a desired altitude within the shortest horizontal distance traveled. So if we're trying to outclimb an obstacle, we want to make sure that we get to the height above that obstacle without using up too much horizontal distance, right? We want to get above that before we <laughs> meet the obstacle, right? So that's what VX is going to give us. It's our best angle of climb speed because it's where we have the maximum excess thrust. If VX is our max angle of climb speed, then there's another speed that's going to give us our best climb rate speed, or in other words, it's going to get us to a certain altitude in the shortest amount of time. So here the unit of measurement is time, it's not distance. So VY is what we're calling this. It's our best rate of climb speed, the speed that if we use, we're going to reach a certain altitude in the shortest amount of time. So because we're talking about time and we're not talking about distance, we need a different unit of measurement, right? So when we were talking VX and we were talking distance, that was really just about thrust and drag, those forces of flight, you know, how many pounds this way versus how many pounds that way. Now that we're talking about time, we have to take in some other considerations. We have to talk about power. So what's power? So power is the thrust of the aircraft moving a certain amount of weight for a certain amount of time. So if time is what we need, then power is going to take that time into consideration. In the United States, we use something called horsepower, which is a little bit an archaic term, but it means that we're moving a certain amount of weight, a certain distance for a certain amount of time. So your engine is going to be rated in how much of that power it produces. So power can also be thought of as the amount of thrust for a given airspeed. So what the power required curve looks like there, that first curve there, is it's just the thrust required curve multiplied by the airspeed. And then obviously it's going to be converted so that it makes sense to us Americans that use horsepower. But the curve is going to be shaped somewhat similar to what you see there. And then the power available curve is that blue curve above it. Now the concept is the same as VX, right? We're just going to find the maximum excess power. That's that airspeed that's going to give us the longest dashed line, the biggest distance between the blue line and the black line there. Where that speed is, is called our best rate of climb speed, our VY speed. It happens to be slightly faster than VX, and it allows the aircraft to reach a desired altitude within the shortest amount of time. What does this look like in terms of our takeoff picture? So here we are on a runway with a nice big windmill right at the end of it. You know, maybe they, uh, they, they built this runway as an afterthought and they, uh, they put it right in the middle of a farm and there's this big 50 foot obstacle right on the end of the runway. This is gonna be sort of a proverbial uh, concept here, this 50 foot obstacle right at the end of the runway. This is what we wanna make sure that we're able to out climb, right? It's not always good enough to just be able to get off the ground. You also have to get off the ground and then out climb something that might be at the end of this runway. So 
what speed is going to allow us to clear that obstacle with some clearance? Well, our VX is our best climb angle speed. And that means that if we use that speed, we're going to eat up the least amount of distance to reach 50 feet. So you see there that we're reaching 50 feet well in advance of that windmill. And then we're just continuing the climb after that. VY is our best rate of climb speed. So whereas that speed might allow us to just barely outclimb that windmill, doesn't give us a whole ton of buffer above it. So if we're trying to get above that obstacle, we're definitely better off going with VX than VY. However, one good thing about using VY, and one reason why we typically use VY if we're not really concerned about outclimbing a windmill or something like that, is because over the same amount of time, the aircraft climbing at VY is going to achieve a higher altitude. You can kind of see that in the uh, in the lines that are drawn here, right? If you think about each one of those tan lines that are representing like the same amount of time elapsed, like 30 seconds or 45 seconds since takeoff, in that same 45 seconds, the aircraft climbing at VY will have gotten to a higher altitude, even though its climb angle might not be as good as the aircraft that took off at VX. So it's all trade-off, right? What do you want to do on takeoff? Do you want to outclimb an obstruction? VX is your best bet. Do you want to get to your highest altitude as soon as you can? That's VY. Now, typically we want to use VY if we don't have to worry about smacking into something because altitude is going to give us options. We want to get up to that high altitude as soon as we can, because the higher we are, the more options that we have, right? You know, the, the, the further we can glide, if we have an engine problem, the uh, further we can look, you know, the better we're able to navigate by seeing more of the, uh, the surrounding environment. So it's all trade-off based on what you want to do, but this is the difference between VX and VY. Now let's take a look at landings. It turns out that the same things that are good for our performance and takeoff are also good for our landing performance. And the same things that are bad for takeoff performance affect us poorly in landing performance as well. A higher weight of the aircraft and a higher density altitude are going to both lend themselves to a longer ground roll. What that means is that, for example, if your aircraft is heavier, it's going to take more time. It's going to take more of a force to get the aircraft stopped. So that heavier aircraft is going to eat up more runway after the wheels touch down, just bleeding off all that extra force and energy of it moving. The brakes uh, have to work a little harder to get it slowed down. By the same token, a higher density altitude, and remember, a higher density altitude means the, the density of the air is lower. So sometimes it's, uh, it's a little tough to keep those concepts together. Remember, the high density altitude just means that it's as if you're operating at a higher altitude where the air density is lower. So try not to get twisted around with the, with the concepts there, right? High density altitude means the air density is lower and the performance is going to degrade as well. Now, the reason that your ground roll is affected by high density altitude or low density altitude is that remember your indicated airspeed is going to be lower for a given true airspeed at a higher density altitude. Let's, let's think about that. When the air pressure is lower, like it is up at higher altitudes, there's less air going into the pitot tube and also less air going over the wings and just you, the aircraft has less air molecules to, to use to produce lift. So in order for the aircraft to approach at a ideal approach speed, you know, one that kind of gives you a good buffer against stall speed, there's, there's different approach speeds that aircraft are going to use. Depending on what you fly, you'll get familiar with your ideal approach speed, but that speed is designed to give you a little bit of a buffer above stall. Well, if your indicated airspeed for that speed is lower and lower because your density altitude is higher and higher, what that means is that you're going to need to fly your aircraft faster in regard to true airspeed. Your true airspeed is going to be, have to be higher to get that same indicated airspeed on final approach. So if you're flying faster, it's going to take you longer to get stopped. Once the wheels are down on the ground, your faster moving aircraft is going to require more runway to get stopped. So heavier weight and higher density altitude, they're not going to affect how much runway you eat up before the wheels touch down, but they're going to affect your ground roll. Ground roll meaning the amount of time it takes, the amount of distance it takes to get from where the wheels touch down to getting your aircraft stopped. Just like in takeoffs, landings are going to be affected greatly by the wind direction and the velocity experienced as you're coming in on approach.
So remember, just like in the takeoff, you want to start eating the carrot from the narrow end first. These wind socks don't look like carrots. The, the orange and white throws you off. I think maybe it looks more like a candy corn, but that eat the narrow end first only works for carrots, not candy corn. So however you want to think about it, basically you want that narrow end of the wind sock to be facing you like it is in the bottom image there, because that means that the wind is a headwind. It's coming in your face as you come down on approach. So either take off or landing, that's what we're looking for. You always want to conduct it into the wind as much as you can. Reason for that, in the top image where you have a tail when the wind's behind the aircraft, that's going to push your aircraft further down the runway. It's going to cause the aircraft to float further down the runway and it's going to delay the point that it touches down at. Well, if you touch down further down the runway, then the total amount of runway that you use up in your landing is going to increase to the point where you see that aircraft in the top image is having a lot of trouble getting stopped before uh, it runs out of runway completely. So takeoffs, landings, uh, doesn't matter which one it is, you always want to orient yourself into the wind. Eat that carrot from the narrow end first. The use of flaps plays a role in your landing performance as well. Remember in takeoff that, you know, we sort of try to find a little bit of a compromise between that added lift from flaps and that added drag that you have to accept as well. But in landing, we'll take as much lift and as much drag as we can get. So typically, you're going to want to use as much flap extension as the aircraft is capable of. So Cessna 172s are going to use about 30 degrees, 40 degrees if you're flying some other models of 172s. Whatever that maximum flap setting is, that's generally what you'd like to approach the runway at. Now think about what flaps do for you. They increase the camber of the wing. To put that another way, they increase the ability of the wing to create lift. So without you doing anything else to the aircraft, in terms of speed, in terms of angle of attack, you've gotten a bonus to the amount of lift that the wing produces. Now you can do a bunch of different things with that bonus. So what do we do with it in landing? It allows us to produce the same amount of lift at a slower airspeed. So the stall speed decreases, it allows us to approach the runway at a slower speed. So we know that if we approach at a slower speed, we're going to have less of a float distance down the runway before the wheels touch down. In addition to that, though, remember that, yeah, we have an increase in lift, but now we've also got an increase in drag. And if you use full flap extension, something like a 30 degree or a 40 degree extension, like a lot of aircraft uh, give you, um, that's going to add enough drag that you're able to fly a steeper approach at the same airspeed. Now, why is that? Well, typically, if you just take your aircraft and you just point it down and you start diving for the deck, so to speak, the aircraft's going to lose altitude, but you're also going to gain airspeed. You're, you're trading one form of energy for another one, and that energy has to be dissipated at some point. And where that's going to be is in the float down the runway. So if you just dive for the deck and your aircraft speeds up, you're going to end up bleeding off that extra airspeed as you float, float, float down the runway and maybe eat up whatever remaining runway you've got. Well, that extra drag from the flaps, that allows you to fly a steeper approach without having to accept that increase in speed. So you get sort of a win-win here with the flaps. You get a steeper approach and you also get to approach the runway at a slower airspeed. So you see on the bottom, slower airspeed, steeper approach, you'll touch down sooner and it'll help you clear an obstacle that'll, that's uh, close to the runway, something like that, if you're in, going into a runway in a closed in area. And compare that with the approach on the top image where the aircraft is coming in zero flaps, it's having to make a very, very shallow angle of approach and it floats much further down the runway before it touches down. You can try this. You can land your aircraft with zero flaps. And plenty of aircraft don't have flaps at all. Remember, it's a secondary flight control. But just expect that the aircraft is going to come in at a much shallower, almost like a banana peel shaped angle, and float much further down the runway before the wheels will actually touch down. A rainy day could have negative effects on your landing, too. If it's raining hard enough and there's pools of standing water collecting on the surface of the runway, what's going to happen as your aircraft passes over that water is that the tires are going to hydroplane over the water. This is the same thing that'll happen in your car on a rainy day on the highway. And basically what's happening is that a thin film of water is getting between the bottom of your tire and the runway itself. So it's almost as if instead of the tire making direct contact with the runway, it's sort of skating on top of a thin film of water that's separating it from the runway. The tire is not going to be able to rotate. Even though it's free to rotate, it won't be 
rotating along with the speed of the aircraft. So if it's not rotating the brakes, which all, all they do is stop that or slow down the rotation of the tire, the brakes won't really be much help for you. So if you can't use your brakes to get slowed down, you're gonna eat up a lot more distance in trying to get stopped on the runway. And even worse, it could lock up. In other words, the brakes will be sort of half effective, so they'll, uh, they, they won't uh, be able to get you stopped and it'll have some trouble in directional control as well. So the braking action, sometimes you hear pilots talk about what kind of braking action the runway has. That's gonna have a big effect on how much runway you eat up in a landing. So that's the general concept behind takeoff and landing performance, but how do we translate that into actual numbers? What we can actually expect from the particular aircraft that we're gonna take on our flight so that we can plan around it. This is where the pilot's operating handbook is gonna come back into play. And what we're looking at specifically here is section five, the performance section. This is gonna have very detailed charts on all of the expected takeoff, climb, cruise, and landing performance numbers that we can expect to get out of our aircraft for certain conditions for our flight so that we can make sure we've got enough takeoff and landing distance on the runways that we're gonna use and we can get an idea of how long it's gonna take us to get from point A to point B and how much fuel we can expect to burn on the way. So we're gonna dive into the numbers here for the performance section of the Cessna 172 that we're flying. Let's start with our takeoff distance calculations. Now we're not gonna get very far in the flight if the runway that we're taking off from isn't long enough to accommodate our aircraft. So we wanna make sure that the performance that we can expect on takeoff is good enough that you know we've got enough runway to be able to uh, have our aircraft uh, leave the ground and clear a 50 foot obstacle or clear an obstacle in front of the aircraft so this chart here in the poh in section five is the takeoff distance chart before we dive into the numbers let's look through these notes and conditions so first of all it says maximum weight 2400 pounds now for the cessna 172 this is the max gross weight of the aircraft you can't go any higher than this and be legal in this POH, if you flip through in your version of it, you'll see that there's different charts for lighter weight aircraft. So it goes to 2,400, to 2,200, to 2,000 pounds. We're gonna use max gross just to show you that, again, as that weight goes up, the takeoff performance degrades, the amount of runway required increases. Let's look at the conditions, right? The, the, these are the assumptions that it's making. It's saying that we're gonna use 10 degrees of flaps. We're gonna have full throttle prior to brake release. We're on a paved level dry runway. Remember, this is kind of like you know canceling out all some of those other uh, negative effects of takeoff performance, and you can have zero wind. Obviously, those are big uh, big assumptions. The notes here: number one, short field technique as specified in section four. Now, if you want to flip back to section four, what it'll show you is it's going to tell you how to execute a short field takeoff. Basically, this is a takeoff where you don't have much runway and you've got an obstruction in front of you. So things like 10 degrees of flaps and giving it full power before you release the brakes and using VX in the climb out, that's, that's all gonna be part of that short field tech, uh, technique that they're talking about. This is prior to takeoff from fields above 3000 feet. The mixture should be lean to give maximum RPM. Just you know, acknowledging that as you get higher up in altitude, the mixture is gonna have to change to give you the max power. Now, in number three there, it says decrease the distance 10% for each nine knots of headwind, right? Again, if you have a headwind, you're not gonna need as much runway, so you can decrease the distance by 10%. Now, you continue on that note, it's a little interesting. It says for operations with tailwinds up to 10 knots, increase the distance by 10% for each two knots. So think about that for a second. You get to decrease 10% for nine knots of headwind, but if the wind is gusty, every additional two knots is going to give you that same 10% penalty. So the penalty for a tailwind is way worse than the benefit from the headwind. Don't take off with a tailwind. And then for operation on a dry grass runway, increase the distance 15% for the ground uh, of the ground roll figure. Again, the grass runway, you're going to eat up more of that surface before the wheels are able to leave the ground. So we need two things to calculate our performance here. Given that you know, all these conditions are met for the takeoff. We're not going to factor wind or grass field or any of that stuff into uh, into our takeoff. We need our pressure altitude, which we could find uh, if you go back uh, earlier in the class. We we gave the formula for that. 
and we need our outside air temperature. So let's just assume the pressure altitude is sea level and the outside temperature is 30 degrees Celsius, right? And this is gonna change depending on the day and depending on where you're operating from, but we'll make that assumption just for the easy use here. So starting from that column, that pressure altitude column, you see where it says SL, that's sea level. So we'll move to the right of there until we get underneath the column where it says our outside air temperature, our 30 degrees. So you'll move to the right until you get that ground rule column and then that total to clear a 50 foot obstacle column. It's saying that at a sea level pressure altitude at 30 degrees Celsius, your ground rule is gonna be 995 feet and then your total distance to get off the ground and then climb to 50 feet another, uh, to get above that uh, mythical 50 foot obstacle is gonna be 1,810 feet. And usually it's that second figure we're more interested in. It doesn't really do us much good to get off the ground if we can't out climb what's on the other end of it. So when I'm looking at, do I have enough runway for this takeoff? I wanna make sure I've got at least that 1,810 feet and probably a lot more. Keep in mind that these figures were gotten by doing flight tests with factory new aircraft, with flight test pilots, you know, pilots that are better than you and me. Um, so these guys were in ideal conditions in factory new aircraft at the peak of their performance. And these are the numbers they got. So it's always a good idea to add in a fair buffer, make sure you've got plenty more runway than the numbers indicate that you need. Landing distance can be calculated the same way. So a few pages later in the pilot's operating handbook, you'll find the landing distance performance chart. So we'll take a look at the conditions again here. It's going to tell you your flap setting. So here we're being told that 30 degrees of flaps is going to get us the numbers that we see in the charts here. The power will be off. You'll use maximum braking on the runway. The runway is going to be paved, level and dry and no wind. And then you have the notes. First one is telling you that, yeah, in addition to that short field takeoff technique that they're giving you earlier, there's going to be a short field landing technique also specified in section four, that normal operation section. Now, what that involves for the Cessna 172 is about getting the wheels down as soon as you can, as short on the runway as you can, and then getting stopped as, as quickly as you can. It's involved getting the weight on the main wheels, on the main gear, and then applying maximum braking. And then once again, it's gonna have you change those landing distances for headwinds and tailwinds. And again, watch that penalty, that bigger penalty for the tailwind than the bonus that you get from the headwind. And then finally, there's gonna be a uh, increase to the takeoff, or I'm sorry, the landing distance for a dry grass runway. So we'll take the same assumptions, pressure out to sea level and an outside air temperature at 30 degrees. And starting from that sea level, uh, figure there will move to the right under the 30 degree column, giving us a ground rule of 570 feet and a total distance to clear the 50 foot obstacle and get stopped of 1325 feet. And notice something here. We have the exact same assumptions as the takeoff, right? Same pressure altitude, same temperature. But if you remember the takeoff distance to clear that 50 foot obstacle was 1810 feet and the landing distance is only 1325 so uh, as a general rule it, we're going to require less distance to land than we will to take off this is an important point because a lot of times we talk about you know short field landings being such a challenging thing for pilots to undertake and a lot of times you get uh, some pilots will come in and it's almost like a glory thing to being able to land on a really short field. We have a public airport here in Maryland called Clearview up in uh, Carroll County that has about an 1800 foot runway. So a lot of people will land there and uh, being able to say you landed there is a really kind of a, a good feather in your cap. In fact, you can get a mug if you go into the uh, into the shop there that says that you landed at Clearview Air Park. Now, it's one thing to land there, right? You can get into a beautiful short field landing, get yourself stopped, high five your friends. You know, your hand can, can, can hurt you high fiving your friends so much, but guess what? You need more runway to take off than you needed to land. So your perfectly beautiful short field landing is going to be a moot point if you can't get your aircraft out of there in the same conditions, right? You might have to wait until winter time to get your aircraft out of Clearview Airport uh, where the pressure altitude and the density altitude will be more favorable to take off. So caution. In addition to takeoff and landing performance, we can use section five of the POH to figure out our climb and cruise performance. So that's going to tell us how 
much time we can expect to spend in both the climb portion and the cruise portion of our flight, as well as how much fuel we're likely to burn. Right? These are two really important things for planning, right? We want to make sure we take enough fuel on the flight that we don't run out halfway through. So we'd like to know what our burn rate is going to be, and we'd like an idea for how long it's going to take us to get from where we're going to our destination. So let's take the example here. We're going to go from Annapolis to New York. It's a straight line distance of 166 nautical miles, and we're going to make this flight in a standard temperature day, and we're going to cruise at 9,000 feet, So, and, and also the winds are going to be calm. So we're interested in knowing how long and how much distance are we going to eat up getting from our point of departure, our takeoff point, up to our cruise altitude of 9,000 feet, and then for the remaining trip, after we've gotten to that 9,000 feet, how long is it going to take us to get to our destination in New York? So the first page is our climb performance page there. It's right out of section five. And let's you know just take a look at the conditions once again. It's flaps up, it's full throttle, and it's standard temperature. And they'll give you some notes. Now, they're going to tell you to add some uh, fuel burn for things like engine start, taxi and takeoff allowance we'll ignore that we'll we'll just we're only concerned with the amount of time and the amount of fuel that we're going to spend from the moment we get the wheels up to the moment we get the wheels down in new york next it's going to tell you about leaning the mixture for high altitude and then it's going to tell you that if you are at a higher than standard temperature like a 10 degrees or, or 20 degrees above standard temperature you're going to have to increase the time the fuel and the distance that you need right higher density altitude poor performance is going to take you longer you'll burn more fuel and uh, you'll have to travel further and then finally the distances shown are based on zero wind right the wind in your face is going to slow you down the wind behind you is going to speed you up so let's look at this, right? So first in the, in the climb here, we'll go down to 9,000 feet. So we're interested in going from sea level pressure altitude up to a pressure altitude of 9,000 feet. So you look all the way at the bottom of the chart there, which says 9,000, and then go across to those three columns under from sea level, meaning we're climbing from sea level. It's going to give you three figures. It's going to tell you it's going to take 20 minutes to get up to that altitude. You're going to burn 3.6 gallons, and you'll have traveled 26 miles. So we can sort of add that as the first sort of bit of planning for our flight. Right? And that's that first 26 miles of the 166 mile trip taken care of. What about the rest of it? That's where the cruise performance comes in. So for cruise performance, we're going to use another page in section five, the cruise performance page. Notice the conditions. It's having us at our max gross weight of 2,400 pounds. And what it's doing is it's going to give you different pressure altitudes that you can cruise at. And we're going to assume that our cruise altitude is 9,000 feet and the pressure altitude uh, is going to be 9,000 feet as well because we're in standard conditions. Make it nice and simple. Notice that there's no 9,000 foot figure here, right? There's only 8,000 and 10,000. So we're going to have to do what's called interpolation. It just means we're taking the average between the 8,000 foot figure and the 10,000 foot figure. That's a little complexity, but nothing we can't handle, right? So that next column next to pressure altitude is RPM. And notice that there's a bunch of figures for each altitude. You can cruise at different RPM settings, right? Higher RPM means more power. So notice that next column just to the right of there is going to be percent BHP. BHP stands for brake horsepower, the amount of power that the engine's producing. A higher RPM is going to be a greater percentage of power produced. Now there's trade-offs and you know you can really run the numbers to see what the pros and cons are of running at a particular RPM in flight. But let's just take a, a kind of plain vanilla uh, middle of the road RPM setting for cruise at 2,400 RPM. Why would you cruise faster? Well, because, or I'm sorry, why would you cruise at a higher RPM? Because the airplane will go faster, but it might not be the most fuel efficient and it might not be the best thing for your engine to run that high. So we'll use a nice sort of middle of the road 2400. Now, notice that they split the rest of this chart into sort of three groupings of columns, right? There's a three columns under 20 degrees below standard temp. There's three columns under standard temp. And then there's three columns. It's a little hidden there, but it's three columns under 20 degrees above standard temp. Our assumption is going to tell us that we're operating at standard temperatures. Notice it, it doesn't say what the temperature is at our altitude because standard temperature, yeah, that means 15 degrees Celsius at the surface, but 
at 9,000 feet, that's going to be well below 15 degrees Celsius. Remember, it drops off two degrees for every thousand feet you climb. So just keep in mind that it sort of applies across the board. But we'll use that middle stretch of columns there under standard temperature. So as we move to the right of the 2,400 RPM figure in both 8,000 feet and 10,000 feet, and you see it circled there in the, in the, uh, in the clip there, the not true airspeed that we can expect at that altitude in standard temperature at those RPM settings is going to be 106 knots for 8,000 feet, 105 knots for 10,000 feet. So it's somewhere right in the middle, right? If we're interpret, if we're truly interpolating, we'll take an average. It'd be 105 and a half. Let's just pick one. Let's take 106 as our expected true airspeed. Notice it's true airspeed. We don't care about indicated airspeed here because we're talking about how long it's going to take us to get from point A to point B. And this is really just distance equals rate times time. So we're talking about the speed that we're actually moving through the air at. Okay, so distance equals rate times time. Remember that from middle school or high school or whenever we learned that? I should have, I should have given you a math alert before this uh, grouping of slides, but uh, you know, here a little surprise, a little bit of arithmetic, but uh, I'll, I'll uh, put it down there at the bottom so you can follow along. So let's think about this. We already ate 26 nautical miles into our 166 nautical, uh, nautical mile trip. We have 140 nautical miles to go. That's the 140 nautical miles we're going to spend in cruise, and we're going to cruise at 106 knots. So in order to find out how long that's going to take, we're going to take the distance, 140, and divide it by the speed, 106. It's going to come out with 1.32 hours, or to translate that into minutes, 79 minutes. So the cruise portion is going to take 79 minutes. How about the fuel burn rate? Well, if you notice that next figure there, right, just to the right of the, uh, the, the speed, I have 6.7 gallons per hour. GPH is gallons per hour for that 8,000 foot setting, and then 6.5 gallons per hour at 10,000 feet. So we'll interpolate there, and we'll take 6.6 .6 as our burn rate, 6.6 .6 gallons per hour. And now I can apply the time. If I burn 6.6 .6 gallons in an hour, and I'm flying for 1.32 hours, I'll multiply those, and I'll get 8.7 gallons. So that's how much fuel I'm going to burn in the cruise portion. So guess what? We have everything we need to figure out how long this trip is going to take and how much fuel we need uh, for the entire trip. So that brings us to our totals there on the bottom right. My total fuel is going to be that 3.6 gallons that I calculated for my climb plus the 8.7 gallons that I need for cruise. Give me 12.3 gallons of fuel that I need for this trip. And then time, I'm taking that 20 minutes of time that I calculated for the climb and adding 79 minutes in the cruise. It gives me 99 minutes, or just over an hour and a half to get from Annapolis to New York. Not bad, right? Beats the Jersey Turnpike, I can tell you that.